Uh, how many of you were able to be here for Home in the Park? Raise your hand. Gosh, it was fun. Uh, we had this like spirit of joy that kind of overwhelmed the crowd. And as we were able to do baptisms in the river um, at Lakeside Park, which I'm still a little bit bitter about, they call it Lakeside Park and it's a river. Um, and, then, and then we celebrated with a full rock band and just uh, like this, um, this spirit of celebration was just with the crowd. And I had my friend here, Mike, who preached uh, this last week, and he said, of the, this community, of this church, he said, there's this, there's this spirit of joy that surrounds Shepherd that's really sweet and good, and it's attractive. It will be attractive to the world around you. And that, that um, there's a difference between like happiness and joy. Happiness is circumstantial, but joy runs deep. Uh, and it's been just a great season here as we celebrated with the kids, VBS. I got to dress as an elephant for five days in a row. That was really fun. <laughs> and um, I'm wearing a fuzzy elephant costume, and I think it was like about 95 degrees inside it, <laughs> even when the air conditioner was on full blast. Uh, we as a church have just rounded out a series on the Apostles' Creed. Uh, a creed is just a statement of faith of what we believe. And so we just finished with that third part of the creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And we thought, you know, uh, that, that isn't enough time to talk about the work of Holy Spirit. Um, Holy Spirit is uh, a present and active in the lives of every believer, of every follower of Jesus. And how could we encapsulate everything that Holy Spirit does in one teaching? So what we've done now is expanded that series for the next three weeks. We'll be talking about the work of Holy Spirit in our lives as followers of Jesus. And we, we're entitling this series, Better. Better. And we'll get into the reason for that in a moment. Um, but I wanted to start off with a game. Are you ready to play? I've been playing games all week, so I'm kind of in a game mood. Are you ready to play with me? Come on, give me an amen if you're ready to play. Okay. All right. So being that I am new to this neck of the woods, uh, only the last six months, I, I figure I can say that for about a year. And then after a year, you can say you're not new anymore. Uh, so I need a little help on better thans. You know, we, we think of one thing better than another, right? And so this first one I need your help with, is Starbucks better than Caribou or is Caribou better than Starbucks? So give me a cheer if you vote for Starbucks. Ready, go. Okay, I'm, I'm a little afraid to ask. Give me a cheer if it's caribou. All right, so I think I'm gonna need, see here's the problem is that my rewards card at Starbucks is so, I love it so much, I'd have to give it up to, to take on the caribou. All right, next one, next one. Now this was given to me by our young adults, so I don't even know what one of these is. Um, but is it a Birkenstock or Chaco? These are both apparently sandals. So if you are a Birkenstock fan, let me hear it. Okay, now if you are a Chaco fan, let me hear it. So I think the Burks win. I'm, I'm just gonna tell you, sorry. It, like the Burks in California were out in like 1992. <laughs> so we all wear rainbows, rainbows, made in San Clemente, right? Okay, so I'm gonna have to reinvigor my love for Birkenstocks. And now this is the most controversial we are a house divided, I know this. However, is the Vikings better than the Green Bay Packers? So if you are a Vikings fan, let me hear it. Now I can see all of you, like me, are used to disappointment in your life. If you are a Green Bay Packer fan, let me hear it. All right. So we clearly, we clearly have some idea of this concept of better than. That one thing is better than another. And I've been experiencing this in my life recently at the promise of a company called Baldwin Lightstream who provides my internet. <laughs> Baldwin Lightstream has, you know, like the coaxial cable that goes into my house 
And I, you know, when I purchased this house, I'm like, what is this ancient piece of technology that comes into my house? And um, that runs my internet. But they have promised that sometime this spring, I mean summer, that I will receive fiber optic internet. Now, fiber optic internet is supposed to be like lightning fast, right? And so up and down my street, there's these work crews. And they have these big machines, some of them digging trenches in our lawn. Some of them, like, some of them, if, if you're a little bit more savvy and you tell them that you have, like, an invisible fence or you have, like, a sprinkler system, they don't dig a trench through your lawn. They, they like, burrow a hole under it which they have this amazing machine that's like magic. It all of a sudden goes under my lawn and then pops up right in front of my house with this cord. And so they have now dug a trench in my lawn and it requires this prep work for me to get lightning fast connection. And so on my end, I have to prep my house. I have to like drill another hole in my house and run conduit and uh, like if you know me, I'm not the most handy person on earth, so I had to like guy, have this guy Jim come out and help me. Hey, Jim, if you're out here, I love you. Thank you so much. Um, and, and we put this conduit in my house so that I'm ready for this lightning fast connection. And I got to thinking of this idea of better than, that, um, that, that fiber optic is better than coaxial, and maybe someday I will actually know uh, if, if Baldwin actually finishes the project. But this idea of better than, um, I was thinking about Jesus' teachings when he began to talk about the work of Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 16, he's uh, with his disciples for the last night of his life on earth. And he's having this conversation, kind of bringing comfort to them, telling them, hey, like, I'm going to be with you. Um, but I'm not going to be with you forever. In fact, I have to leave. And what he's talking about is his own death. And then he says this. He says, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. And another way of translating that, it is better for you. It is better for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now that word advocate there is translated a lot of different ways in different versions of the Bible. Some people call it advocate. Some people call it counselor. Some people, in some Bibles, it says paraclete. Now if it says paraclete in your Bible, that's because they didn't know how to translate it from Greek, so they just put the letters in English and left it the same. The word paraclete simply means this. The one who is called to walk alongside you. I mean, that's a great image of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is the member of the Trinity, the peace of God, the member of the Trinity, whose job it is to come and walk alongside us. And so Jesus says that it is better for him to go physically so that, that we can now have his presence all the time. When Jesus did ministry on the earth, where was the ministry of Jesus? Wherever he was, right? Look, there's Jesus. He's over there. We, we'll go over there, and he, he'll heal the people around him. He'll do this miraculous work. He'll minister to them. But there's a problem with that, is that if God wants to communicate to the whole world his grace, love, and mercy, it's going to take a long time for Jesus in body to get everywhere. And so his plan was never that Jesus go to everyone everywhere in person, but that the Holy Spirit come to us, and now Jesus is in us, with us, wherever we go. And you and I become representatives of Jesus. We become Jesus with skin on for other people. That we now get to love like Jesus loves. We get to serve like Jesus serves. And Jesus actually said to his disciples in John, he said, you will do greater things than I ever did. And when we think about the global impact of the church, when we are on our best day, when we are our best selves, we do exactly that. We feed the poor. We care for the sick. We love people back into community. We reparent those who have had broken lives and we walk alongside them. And that has zero to do with us and everything to do with God working in us and through us. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. But you see, God had promised this centuries before Jesus ever walked the earth. In the Hebrew scriptures, the Holy Spirit came upon groups of people, or usually one individual, called a prophet for a short period of time to do a specific task, to share a specific message. And so those prophets of old came and they shared that message. Sometimes they did miraculous works as signs of how good God was, but it was generally one person at a time. And at a really troubling part of Israel's history, God sent a message to a guy named Joel. And Joel said this in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Uh, He said, and afterwards, and he's talking about a time of trial, and afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. This would have been earth shattering for them. That would not have made sense. No, wait. God only works at one person at a time. He only picks one person to speak for him. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And it was a rarity for the spirit to choose, quote unquote, in that culture, uh, a female prophetess. But now this promise is saying, no, no, no. I am leveling the playing field. I am now taking all of your kind of cultural mindsets, all of your presuppositions and the way you look at the world, and I'm about to change it all. And the one hinge point in all of history for that was Jesus. Jesus came and he rehumanized us. He went to the cross for every human. He gave his own life so that shame and sin and the devil and anything broken in this world can no longer claim us. And even though we might feel those chains grabbing at us, even though we might feel at times the ache of the old wound, that Christ has said, no, I come to set you free. And in order to help you live free, I send the Holy Spirit. And this is for everyone everywhere. This is available to every human. And that's a big promise. And so now we're waiting for hundreds and hundreds of years for that promise to be fulfilled. And Jesus is that linchpin. He says, okay, everything's prepped. Now you're ready for your lightning fast internet. And it all starts on this one day called Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus died and resurrected, um, 40 days um, He was on earth with us, and then this 10-day gap where they were kind of waiting. And the last thing Jesus said to them before he went up to be with the Father is he said, now, wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, this is Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Then, now verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Now, those are places far away for us. Think this. Um, You will be my witnesses for me, Hudson, the River Valley, the Midwest, and the ends of the earth. That our influence grows as we love like Jesus loves, as we serve like Jesus serves, and we are supernaturally empowered to do that by his love in our lives, by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. But if you remember back, what was that first word that he said? Wait. Anyone in this room like, like me, ready, fire, aim? No. Okay, I'm the only one. <laughs> so here's the deal. I, if you haven't noticed, I have a little bit of energy. Um, and I love new ideas. I love finding new ways to reach out to the world. But sometimes I hear like an opportunity. I'm like, let's go. This is fantastic. Um, but what Jesus reminds me is that if I try to do something under my own power, I'm going to burn out. I'm going to fail. I'm not going to be uh, I'm not going to be able to complete the vision because where is it coming from? It's coming from me. And so Jesus says, "Wait for the Holy Spirit." So these guys are all waiting in their room, hanging out, 10 days go by. When's it going to happen? I mean, Jesus said, "Wait. How long does he want us to wait?" And then all of a sudden, 
like the reader, uh, Jerry, he read the text for us. It sounds like a rushing wind. And, and then tongues of fire, uh, what looks like fire, appears over their head. And all of a sudden they're like human candles, which would be a little bit weird to me. But here's the thing. This, this presence of the Spirit represented as fire is like when Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And so now this presence of the Spirit that appears like fire over them and compels them to what? Do something absolutely insane. They start speaking in other languages that they never learned. This actually happened to my friend Tim when he was on a mission trip, when he was young, when he was in college. They needed a translator. He didn't speak a lick of Spanish. and like, you're going to translate this message. And Tim's like, no, I'm not. What are you talking about? And he gets up and he is able to communicate in Spanish, though he never learned the language. And to this day, he speaks it fluently. Uh, these things happen and they're weird. And I don't understand why they happen in certain contexts and not all the contexts. But I do know this, they always have the same purpose. And that purpose is that God wants to communicate his love and grace to a new group of people. And so this is important about this text. It isn't just about the languages. It's about the people who heard them. At this time in Jerusalem, there were people from all over the known world coming there to worship. People who couldn't communicate with each other. And now they're hearing this gospel message, gospel means good news, in their own tongue, in a way that they would not have expected coming into town. And this undoes something that happened way early in the Hebrew scriptures. Before the people were the people of Israel, that before any of that, there was a, a man named Nimrod, and he was a king. And he said, I will make for myself a great nation. I will make my name great. And then he began to gather all the people of the world, and he built a tower. And that tower is called the Tower of Babel, or Babel, right? And so when people are babbling, it's from this story of the Bible. God looks at that and says, hey, all these people are unified, but they're unified in a really negative way, a self-destructive way. This isn't good. And so God confuses their language and sends them off. And then he picks a guy, a guy who may as well have been as good as dead, a 80-something-year-old guy who has no future, no kids. And he says, you, Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I will make your name great. You know what the thing is? God loves the underdog. God loves to take people who are just ordinary people, who aren't um, the shiniest of the shiny, who aren't the best of the best. And sometimes he takes those people too. And he says, I'm going to do something great with you, but it's me that's doing it so that you know that you have to rely on me. God's heart is so that the world would see all the things that are happening and realize that it's God's good heart and good nature and love and ascribing unsurpassable worth to every person. And so this event happens and it's now fulfilling what had been promised in the gospel or the book of Joel, now in Acts. And so this good news message of Christ and who he is goes out to all these people and there's a group of people there who are like, uh, it's the Feast of Weeks. They're just drunk. They're, they're mocking them because they hear all these languages and think, hey, they're, they're slurring their speech. And Peter stands up. And Peter begins to preach to them, to tell them just who Jesus is. And remember, it had only been weeks since Jesus had been crucified in that very city. A, a terrible sinner's death, a criminal's death. And Peter who was the same guy who, when they came to arrest Jesus, does two things. One, he pulls out a sword and tries to defend him, cuts off a servant's ear. Jesus says, hey, no, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. That's where we get that phrase. And then when he realized that he'd done wrong, Jesus does the, or Peter does the exact opposite. He runs and hides. This does not sound like someone who's very brave to me, does it? It does not sound like the best of the best to me. In fact, it kind of sounds like something that I might do. <laughs> Just being honest. <laughs> See that, but God had a different plan for Peter. And because of the empowering presence of the Spirit, then in Acts, Peter is able to get up and preach to them. And he, I'm not going to go through the text, 
Uh, but he says to them, hey, remember this prophecy in Joel, it's being fulfilled in your presence, in your hearing. And this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made to be the Messiah. And he has given him to rescue all of you. And then the people, it said, they, they were cut to the heart. And they said, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? And Peter says, look, just repent, which just means change your mind. Uh, change the way you've been thinking. And come and be baptized. And you'll receive the Holy Spirit. The, all the same things you see these people doing, you'll do them. And the Holy Spirit goes on all throughout Acts to do amazing things. The title of the book of Acts is Acts of the Apostles. They should have retitled it Acts of the Holy Spirit because the book is about how God in Holy Spirit is working in all of us to carry his message of grace and love and mercy to rehumanize the world. Because we look at our news and we see subhuman actions, don't we? I mean, don't you, I read the news, I'm like, Ugh. Like, I have to put away the news. But when I read the gospel, and I see what we could be, when I look at the video from Wednesday night, and I see all the people from Hudson walking around and coming to hear the music, and coming to hang out because we're having fun. Yes, it is okay for Christians to have a blast. Absolutely. We should be having more fun than anyone. And then, for us to take people who come to us when they're broken, when they're hurting, and say, let me walk alongside you because we have one who walks alongside us. That is special and good and beautiful. But it requires us to do a couple of things. The first one is that we have to be willing to do things that make absolutely no sense, like in human eyes. I mean, imagine this. You're, you get up in the morning and you're like, I wonder if I'll end up speaking a language I don't know today and telling a bunch of people about Jesus. Not top of my list. Is it the top of yours? Or I wonder if we'll heal someone today. Or I wonder if we'll change some um, economic status of someone and bring people back into community. These are not things that I walk around thinking about every day. But the Holy Spirit does. It, it happened to me this way 10 years ago. Michelle and I, we... Um, we were kind of finishing up a season in higher education and I've been serving a church, but I knew it wasn't a church I was called to long term. And we were kind of interviewing at other churches. Michelle was pregnant, very pregnant, and not feeling well on bed rest. And they had told us that our daughter was gonna have Down syndrome. And so we're like wrestling all that out. And one night I go to sleep. And usually the Lord, when he wants to speak to me, he speaks to me through this. Like, if you want old dead languages translated, I'm your guy. Like, if you want history, I'm your guy. If, if the whole, but when God wants to speak in a dream or something like that, that's Michelle's world. Like, I've learned to trust that when Michelle wakes up and she's like, hey, I've been praying about this. I think God wants us to think about this. Or God woke me up and I'm supposed to pray for this one person. Like, that is the way the Spirit empowers her. So I had this dream one night that I'm supposed to plant a church. And you ever had a dream that was like super vivid? And you're like, you wake up and you're like, wait, did that really happen or not? Maybe I just been watching too much TV, I don't know. But I wake up and I begin to articulate this dream to Michelle. And um, she's brushing her teeth and uh, she's, she's kind of leaning against the, the counter. And I said, you know, God, I feel like God spoke to me in a dream, it, which is always a little suspect, right? And, and then I begin to articulate all the things and Michelle went like white. I was like, are you okay? Are you gonna throw up? Are you okay? Like, what do I need to do? You know, if you've ever been around a pregnant lady, like, you, you're ready to do whatever she needs you to do, right? And so Michelle, Michelle says, she says, honey, like, I had the exact same dream last night, but I wasn't gonna tell you because I don't wanna do it. <laughs> and I didn't blame her, right? Because I, I thought starting a church was like for crazy people. In fact, I told God two things. I, there's two things I never want to do. One, I don't want to start a new church. Crazy people do that kind of stuff. And two, Jesus, I don't want to be the pastor of a bigger church. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> do you know what I'm learning? Never tell God what you don't want to do. <laughs> and so we were in this season of like interviewing at other churches, but this this idea kept nagging at us and we had to be faithful to it. So we did what every smart person does in entrepreneurship. 
we Googled it. We Googled how to plant a church. And we took a church launch plan, a business plan, and we ordered a couple books online, and she's on bed rest, and we're working on this thing. I mean, just to prove to God that it was a dumb idea. You know, like God, we don't have to do this. That was a terrible idea you had. You should really consult me before you give me these things. And, and you know, it's like the, the Lord, uh, a man plans his steps, but the Lord guides his path. I think it should be edited to say, but the Lord laughs at him. And, and we began to articulate this plan and we took it to a friend of ours who's a pastor and, and showed it to him and he said, um, hey, this is a great plan, but you have two problems. You have no money and you have no people. I'm like, see God, can't do it. <laughs> Took it to our best friends around dinner at their table. And they said, hey, we're in, but other than us, you have two problems. Hey, I know, we have no money and no people. Must mean we don't have to do this. But then all of a sudden, guess what happened? People started showing up and money started showing up and a group of people formed. And it was nothing that I did at all, nothing that Michelle did. It was all the Holy Spirit working in multiple people's lives. And then we created this new congregation called Radiant Church that is a place for people in California who like normally wouldn't fit into church. It's a place where people are loved exactly like they are. We call it warts and all. And God has been doing some amazing things. And here's the thing about the Holy Spirit is that as we are open to Him, connecting us with that lightning fast air and that, as we let Jesus do the prep work in our heart, we begin to recognize his voice faster. We begin to recognize God in different ways and we learn the disciplines of what to do when we think we're hearing from God. So now we go to our small group and we say, hey, we feel like God might be moving us to do this. Would you pray on it and let us know, you know if the Lord stirs anything? We really look at the cost, and sometimes the thing we're called to do is absolutely crazy on the like human spreadsheet, but on God's spreadsheet, it's exactly what he wants us to do. And if God hadn't had given us that experience, then when Nancy Moore, the search consultant for Shepherd of the Valley, called me, I would have said, no, no thanks, I don't want to be the pastor of a big church. But instead, because the Holy Spirit had been working in me, and softening me, and readying me, then now I... I'm here with you, and we get to have this season of life together. And it's the Holy Spirit working in your search team, and then also working in my family, and really Michelle again, because she was like, Jeremy, don't say no to them. I remember that dream I had a few months ago. You see, the Holy Spirit calls us all to crazy things, but we have to be willing to wait for him to do the prep work. We have to be willing to offer to our small group or our community that prays for us the thing that we might be called to and say, Lord, show us through this community. And then when the Holy Spirit shows up, we've got to be willing to look silly. Will you look silly with me to share the love of Jesus? Will you look silly for me in the valley? Will you look silly with me as we um, demonstrate this radical grace that accepts people and loves people right where they are at and expects the spirit to move in their lives because I want to follow that kind of God. The one that radically speaks to us today, here and now, and invites you and I, every single one of us, to go into this world and love like Jesus loves and serves like he serves. Can I get an amen? amen. Then let's pray about it. Holy Spirit, we invite you to do whatever you want to in us, that you can do whatever you want to through us in this valley. God, in each of our um, workplaces, in each of our schools, in each of our uh, hometowns and streets, God, I pray that you would release your spirit through us to touch other people, to ascribe them unsurpassable worth, help them feel your love, and then want to know you more. And then give us courage to speak and to serve. In fact, God, we pray that you would build your kingdom in us and through us so much so that it's an irresistible force of love in this valley. And we commit our hearts to you to that end. In Jesus' name.